Good morning. We are delighted that you have uh, joined us for worship today, whether in person or online. Uh, we just know you'll be blessed. That it'll be a great time in the house of the Lord as we praise and hear His Word proclaimed. Uh, what a what a! I wouldn't. Ra- I would rather be here than anywhere else, wouldn't you? I'm standing here. This is normally where Wayne Courier stands. And of course, some of you know Wayne's under the weather, so uh, that's why you have two Waynes. You have a primary Wayne and an auxiliary Wayne. Okay. <laughs> And I'm the auxiliary Wayne, so I'm in his spot. Uh, We hope he gets feeling better real soon. But, uh, you know, you always have redundant systems like spacecraft and airplanes. But then you'd have to have two Deans and two Clays. Maybe that's not that great an idea. (laughs) We're delighted that you've joined. (laughs) We're delighted you've joined us today. And we want to have joy when we worship. That's what the scriptures tell us is to worship joyfully, worship our God. How else could we, given all that he has done for us? Uh, But we're delighted you're here. We have these Connect cards. If you're retro, like me, uh, means old, uh, and you like to fill out things with a pen, uh, you can fill this out. We'd like to know about you. If you're a visitor, we especially welcome you, or uh, if you've just visited visited with us a few times. We want to know more more about you, and you may want to know more about us, so you can go on our website at nschristianchurch.org and find out more about our church. You can also contact our uh, staff at that uh, website through email, or you can just write it down, or you can capture the QR code and uh, share with us that way. But we'd like to know if you have a need or a prayer a request or anything you'd like us to know, and then, of course, we'd like to know about you as well. But welcome again, and we're delighted you're here. If you'll stand with me right now, we'll pray, and then remain standing as we Praise our God and Savior. Lord, we're so thankful to be able to be in your house today. We know that uh, you want us to gather in your name and to praise you and worship you and to hear your truth declared and proclaimed and then to go out and share that truth wherever we go. We know that you've told us to do that and we just pray that's our reason for being here this morning is so that we can draw closer to you, know more about you, and be better equipped to serve you when we leave here. We pray your blessings on everyone who participates in the service, the musicians, the the minister as he preaches your word, all the others that are helping behind the scenes with our children, and then throughout all the things that happen during this service. We just want your touch on us as we we honor you and praise you in this place. Uh, Be with us as we worship. And then be with us as we go out from this place of worship so that the world can hear the message of Jesus Christ who saves us. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Trust you when you go. 
7 through 11. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord comes again. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the spring and autumn rains. You also be patient. Do not lose hope because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not grumble against one another, or you will be judged guilty, and the judge is ready to come. Take the example of the prophets who spoke for the Lord. They were patient in the face of suffering. As you know, they were blessed because they did not give up. And you've heard of Job's patience, and you know the Lord's purpose for him to the end. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You may be seated as we continue our worship. We were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored, and the church Good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. I want to welcome you to the North Side. Those of you that are here with us in person and those who are watching online, we're grateful you're with us, grateful we can share in this time. Thank you, worship team, for leading us uh, this morning. Really appreciate uh, just uh, helps helping bring us into the throne, right? To usher us before the throne uh, of God together as a people, as a fellowship, as a family of believers. Uh, and what a great thing it is to be here together, to be before our God as the body of Christ. What do you procrastinate about? I don't know if in this series I've asked that question yet. Just to get, you've probably already been thinking about it as we entered this series, uh, trying to identify what is it that I procrastinate about, but what is it for you? Is it a chore that you've been meaning to do around the house? Is it homework? Is it a project at work if you're someone with a job? Is it calling that family member who's just, man, it's just always awkward to talk to that person, you know? Like, there's always that person in our family or maybe even in our friend network. It's like, oh, man, it's just that hard thing to get over. We all procrastinate. Everybody procrastinates at some times, and maybe even we procrastinate all the time. We find ourselves constantly doing it. According to research by Charlotte Lieberman in her New York Times article on procrastination, she says this. I don't, know, maybe, I don't know if you like to study words and word history, but the word procrastination, it comes from a Latin word, procrastinare, which means to put off until tomorrow. You're like, okay, wow, Sherlock, you really, you know, <laughs> woo -hoo, all right, big one. But even beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, she says, there's a Greek origin to the word as well. And the Greek origin from the, the ancient Greek is the word akrasia, which means doing something against our better judgment. Doing something against our better judgment. And if that's, if you're wondering why today we feel so bad often about when we procrastinate, it comes down really to that. When we, are, we know, we're not doing something that we know is in our best interest to do. That's really where the pain and the difficulty 
and the struggle of procrastination comes in. Dr. Tim Pitchell is a professor of psychology, and he is a member of the Procrastination Research Group at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. It's a real thing, folks. It's a real thing. I'm not pulling you guys. It's not April Fool's here or anything like that. Procrastination Research Group, and I mean, someone's got to be studying it, right? Because we're all doing it, so someone better be studying it. He calls procrastination this, and the research he's done, he's what he, here's what he's found. Procrastination is an emotion regulation problem, not a time management problem. Procrastination is about our emotions. As a matter of fact, he was part of a study in 2013 that found that procrastination, again, this very thing, it isn't a unique character flaw that people have or a mysterious curse of our inability to manage time. What, what he found is this, that procrastination is a way of coping with challenging emotions and negative moods induced by certain tasks right? It's, it's not the task itself. It's the boredom. It's the anxiety. It's the insecurity I feel about that conversation I know I need to have. It's the frustration. It's the resentment. It's all of these things. You know, you look at, man, you know, having to clean the bathroom at home, and that elicits certain emotions, <laughs> emotions inside of us, right? You know, maybe some of us, I mean, some of us are like, man, I love to do that. And so you're always eager to do the cleaning. Others of us are like, it's the bathroom. Like, ew, you know, I got to do this. It's that, that cleaning the dirty bathroom or you have to organize a long, you know, boring spreadsheet for your employer at work. Or it might also result from deeper feelings related to the task. Maybe things like self-doubt, right? Maybe we don't, we put off the task because we kind of have this self-doubt about our ability to actually do it and do it well. Some of us stare at a blank document. We sit there and we stare at the, the, the word processor forever on our computer. And the thoughts that are really going through our head are, I'm not smart enough to write this. Or even if I am, what will people think of it? Writing is so hard. Some of us just approach, to us, and there's a mental block, like writing has always been hard. And so like, it's just hard. Like, I just, ugh. I get that. Or maybe the question, what if I do a bad job? That, you know, just, I don't even want to start if I know I'm, it's going to be bad in the end. So the, 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 the truth here, you see these things coming together, and it's this. There's this idea here we can see that the healthier our ability to work through unpleasant or unwelcome emotions, the healthier our approach is going to be to finally moving past procrastination. So how do we decide to finally dig in instead of backing away from the moves that we know need to be made? Last week, I thought, honestly, last week's service, I loved last week's service. I, you know, the, the folks from CR who came and shared, I really appreciated that so much. One of the things we did in last week's service, if you'll remember, we ended the service with the serenity prayer, which is always a part of the CR meetings. And I love the serenity prayer. And the, the phrase of the serenity prayer that always captures my attention, in part because it's a message I feel like God is directing right at me, is this. Is about accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, as the pathway to peace. Accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. You know, a lot of us have never accepted that. A lot of us have never accepted that. Patrick Carnes is a psychologist, studies nine, he describes nine areas of life with behemoth challenges for us that finally need our attention. See if you might identify with some of these, and maybe you might be identifying one of your behemoth challenges today. Achievement is one area. There are high achievers who love breezing through their checklist. And that's because it's the easy thing for them. Getting, doing the checklist, being an achiever, whoa, look at how good I'm doing. That's the easy part. The challenge and the thing that they never do is what's hard for them. And that is slowing down to evaluate the how of how they're achieving their goals. Is what I'm doing healthy? Is it ethical? Those kind of questions. That's the behemoth challenge for them. Likewise, there are underachievers who love getting attention for their failure. And, and they never do the hard work of sticking with something to find success. They're actually afraid of being successful because successful is normal. And they don't know how to operate there because they've always been the failure in the family. How about self-esteem? Some of us have never been, and some of us have been so favored by others in our life that we avoid anything that requires us to think of someone else because we've never had to. It always came our way. People always gave me the attention. People were always pumping me up, and, and, and it always came my way without me doing anything. 
And so the behemoth challenge there is thinking of somebody else. Others of us have been so neglected that the hardest mountain for us to climb is allowing ourselves to have success and to have attention and say, you know what, that's, that's an acceptable thing. Accountability. Some of us have never been truly held accountable for our actions, and so we struggle to willfully enter into relationships and scenarios where we will willfully submit to accountability. Others of us know how to be accountable without truly trying or truly being accountable. We know how to put on the, fra- the, the face of accountability without having to be truly honest about ourselves with anybody. And the behemoth challenge for us is total honesty. Total honesty. Self-care is another one. Now we hear that word all the time. I know it's almost like ad nauseum now we hear about self-care. Some of us grew up in homes where no one cared about our welfare, though. Others of us grew up in homes where so much was done for us that we never learned to do, do it for ourselves. And the behemoth challenge for people in those situations today, in their own respective ways, depending on the perspective you come from, is to make space to care for their basic needs without, being, without neglect or without entitlement. That's the behemoth challenge. Conscience. Some of us live without a conscience about our actions. And the behemoth challenge for this person is to do the work to discover really what your values are. You live without values. The behemoth challenge is to find your values. Find your values, what you stand for, where you do draw the line in the sand, and when will you be willing to take a risk for somebody else to support them or defend them. Realism. Realism is another area. Some of us were never forced to live in reality. We've never had to experience, again, the consequences of our decisions and accept responsibility for the role we played in what played out in our own life. We've never accepted our limits. And so our behemoth challenge is finally allowing ourselves the privilege of being able to learn from our mistakes, our mistakes, self-awareness. Some of us are so uncomfortable with ourselves that we constantly seek distractions to avoid being alone with ourselves. This is one of the biggies, biggies for me. We constantly avoid looking at our interior life. We hate being alone with ourselves, so we turn on the TV. That's been, that's been my modus operandi since I was a middle schooler and I had a little 13-inch color television in my bedroom. <laughs> Growing up, go to the TV. Just, just drown it all out with the TV. Put things off. The behemoth challenge for us is allowing ourselves time and space to live an examined life, going into reading, meditation, journaling, relationships, relationships. Many of us have superficial relationships. Even if we're out in public internally, we feel isolated because nobody knows our whole story. No one knows who we really are. Only a part of it, the part that we want to share. The the, the behemoth challenge for us is finding someone trustworthy to hear that whole story and then giving them the whole story. And lastly, effect. Now, effect is a curious word here, but it's a, a clinical word in sort of therapy kind of areas uh, to talk about the, the emotional life of a human being. Many here today cannot describe their emotions. If I were to ask most people here today, how do you feel today? Even myself, my natural inclination when I get that question is, I feel good. I feel good. After I thought about this, I remembered a song I used to sing. We sang in a big group uh, uh, at, at Tate's Creek, my previous church. <laughs> there was a big group of us singing a song, I feel good, I feel good. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that really wasn't a feeling. Good isn't a feeling. Good isn't a feeling. That's not the language of emotion. The language of emotion is joyful. I feel joyful. I feel pain. I feel sadness. I feel anger. I'm afraid. Those are feelings. And to many of us, that is a foreign language. If I were to ask you that question today, how do you feel? How would you answer based on the words I just used there instead of the word good? When was the last time we literally told someone that we were sad or we were afraid? The behemoth challenge for some of us today is compassion towards and acceptance of the emotional side of our life because it's a reality. It's there. All of these, are. I'm just sharing all of these to kind of start to, to prompt us to say, what is the behemoth challenge in front of me today? <clears throat> what is the behemoth challenge? I want you to turn with me today to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we're going to be, and we're going to start in verse 2. And here's what it says. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 2. <clears throat> and Saul, excuse me. <clears throat> and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, and they were encamped in the valley of Elah, And drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. 
And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. <clears throat> and there came out, there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was, was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of, bron a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his, his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him, and he stood, and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. Yeah, right. That's a big promise, isn't it? But if I prevail against him and kill him, then, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. <clears throat> now, a lot of us know where this story is going, right? This is one of the most well-known stories in the Bible, and frankly, in the world, or so we think, or so we think. We hear the, the story of David and Goliath referenced in a lot of places, not just within the church, but within the culture. We, it's used so often. I mean, we're back in the, the throes of football season, and how many times will we hear, maybe already, because, you know, this is the time of year when all the really big teams play the little, like, mid-major teams. So we hear it all the time. It's a David and Goliath story. And you know, we think about when a lesser team defeats a seemingly more talented team like Purdue. I know how that is. Sometimes we have to take our humility. It's hard to be, it's hard to be one of the best. Eh, I wish. Um, anyway, <clears throat> moving on. Um, <laughs> oh, I wish, I wish. <laughs> um, but we use it all the time in a context where the underdog wins. One of the cautions with a story like this is that this story, though, is so familiar to us that we take it for granted. Sometimes, you know, I even myself, when I'm reading through my Bible, I love 1 Samuel, I love the historical books of the Old Testament where you find this story, and I read through it, and I said David and Goliath, and I'm almost kind of tempted to like skip over that chapter, because I'm like, man, I've been there since I was a kid, in Sunday school, you know, and, and I've heard this story, and we kind of tend to like, the, oh, I know that one, we move on. Do we really know it? A lot of us are, maybe, if we were to look and examine what we believe about this story, what we would find out is that a lot of what we've accepted about this story is what was told us and what was passed down to us. Maybe not even from the Bible, maybe not even from our church, maybe just from the culture. And, and what the culture knows about this story and what its point is. And I wonder, do we know? Do we know? Some of us are probably wrong. Let me ask this question. Is this story about God promising us victory against whatever problem is overwhelming us in the moment? Is that what the story is about? I think if that's what we think this story is about, I want to say today there's a lot more to this than just that. Let me mention something else as well, just a little bit of some things that will help us understand the dynamics happening here. At the time we're reading about in it today in the history, ancient, the ancient Near East, Understand what people thought about when they thought about military conflict. In those days, people equated military strength with a nation's deity. They equated military strength with a nation's deity. Most people assumed in those days that if we went up against your nation and we beat you in battle, that meant our God was superior to your God. And so they were like, I, we have a bigger God. Sometimes it was even geographical. So like if, okay, let's say we went to war at sea, and you beat us at sea, uh, and, and things, then your God was obviously a God of the sea. Our God might be a God of the plains. And so we felt like confident if we were meeting you for battle in the plains, then we would have a better chance. As a matter of fact, at the time period we're looking at today, there was a thought about Israel among the surrounding countries. The people thought around Israel, they saw the God of Israel as a God of the valleys, not, or a God of the mountains, not a God of the valleys. 
And so a large reason why Goliath is probably feeling really confident to come out and say these things. And I believe maybe even Israel maybe sort of thought, hey, maybe this is true of our God as well. There was some self-doubt there. But Goliath is really confident because here, here are the Philistines on this mountain camped. And here are the Israelites on this mountain. And where's the battlefield going to be? It's going to be in the valley between. And if they think that God, the God of Israel, is a God of the mountains and not a God of the valleys, they think, hey, I feel like our chances are pretty good here. And so Goliath is out there. He's talking really big. And the Israelites are, are intimidated by it. All of this is a foreign concept to us in many ways. Today, when we hear about wars, we don't talk about it as battles versus gods, right? We, we know about the war going on between Russia and Ukraine today. And when we hear the reporting on those, on those wars, on what's going on, the battles that are happening there, we don't hear anything about, well, today the, the recapture of this city was a victory for Ukraine's God over the God of, of Russia. Uh, we, don't, we don't hear that kind of talk. But if this were how happening in the time of Saul, in the time of David, the, re the news reporting would have been like, what a great victory you know, for, for, for Ukraine's God or, you know, for, or for Russia's God, depending on the perspective. And it's helpful to know this. You know, anytime we go back and we look at the Old Testament and we read, sometimes we look at the Old Testament and say, man, that was bloody back then. It's important to understand, well, why, why was God doing what he was doing? He was doing, he was working in a way that the people in, around would understand, that would communicate to them in a language that said, hey, this God, the God of Israel, with every defeat, with every victory, the God of Israel is proving himself to actually be the one true living God. He, they understood it in that context. And so a lot of times God is working militaristically to share the message and reveal to the people who he is, even to the surrounding nations. It's also understood, it needed to be understood today <clears throat> that it was this accepted practice in those days in warfare to substitute man-to-man -man combat for full-fledged battles between armies. Now, the prevailing idea was that a lot of times it's like one of those things they convince themselves, oh, this is a good idea, but it never works. Is that, yeah, you, your guy, bring your guy against my guy. That way we don't have bloodshed and we just decide it with that one man battle against each other. But you know what almost never happened? It was never the end of the conflict, it was always the beginning of the conflict. And even in this story, it's the beginning of Israel chasing the Philistines to the hills, essentially, because of, of that's just how it went. But this would happen, and the idea was that it would mitigate bloodshed, but it just rarely worked. Let me ask one question before we move on in this story a really important question to ask. Of what we've read so far, is Goliath the only physically imposing figure in this story? The answer is no. Most historians believe, just for context, that Goliath himself was, at the, at the very minimum, he was six foot nine. Some people put it at, at higher than that. Sometimes, and you can kind of get ridiculous at some point in time, but it's, but it's like that's at least the minimum. He's a six foot nine or more. And there's a reason I believe Goliath says when he challenges Israel in, in, uh, in the passage we read, he says, aren't you the servants of Saul? Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 23, the moment when Saul is crowned king of Israel. And here's what it says. It says, and when he stood among the people, he being King Saul, or Saul at the time, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. This is something, I, I don't know, maybe you ne we've never, I'd never had seen this before until I read the story here this week and was studying it. In all the camp of Israel, the most logical person to face Goliath is King Saul. Physically, from physical perspective, he is the most logical person to face Goliath. But he does nothing because he's completely afraid, just like the people are afraid. Verse 16 tells us that they sit there, as a matter of fact, later on, so we, get, we didn't get to verse 16, but later on, verse 16 will tell us that they actually sit there for 40 days letting Goliath come down from the mountain and taunt them because of their fear. What? They're procrastinating. Saul's procrastinating this challenge. He didn't used to be this insecure. You go all the way back to chapter 11 of 1 Samuel, and he's rallying to Israel to great victory with great faith. But what's happened since chapter 11 is he's turned his back on God. He's turned his back on God, and Samuel has just come right out and told him. We talked about it a few weeks ago. He came out and just told Saul, I'm giving the kingdom. God's giving the kingdom to somebody else. And so Saul, he knows God has, has, has said, you know what? Your time is up. And so there's a tremendous insecurity because of what he's done, because for he has a history now of not doing what was in his best interest to do. And someone's coming around the corner with a much different vision of things. David is the youngest of eight brothers. 
And with all the idleness of the army sitting there for 40 days and, and, and 40 nights, <laughs> there's time for David to make the 20-mile the trip from Bethlehem to the front lines to give provisions to his brothers who are fighting with the army. We pick it all back up in verse 22. It says this, And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Big mistake. Big. Huge. Some of you got that. <laughs> Verse 26. Pretty woman. <laughs> Julia Roberts. Verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David has a different vision for these events than anyone else. He sees things that not everybody else is seeing. Theologian Bill Arnold describes it this way, the Israelite army, including his brothers and King Saul, that what they see, when they see Goliath, they see this intimidating infantryman from the Philistine camp who looks and sounds invincible. David, however, hears and sees only blasphemous defiance of the armies of the living God, the living God. Other people see reasons for fear and intimidation, but D David sees only reasons for taking immediate action. Again, in this time period, Goliath knows he's not just challenging the people. Again, he's challenging their God. He knows when he talks to about Israel, when he taunts Israel, he is challenging the God of Israel, who happens to be the only God among all gods who's not made of wood and stone, but is actually living. And he's about to find that out. This is intentional blasphemy of Israel and our holy God. It's spiritual as much or more than it is a physical issue here. It's amazing that the Israelites don't see this, but keep in mind, they're being led by a leader who himself has turned his back on God. David sees with clearer vision. Verse 31. And when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth. Probably really more like young adult would might be the, the better way to, to look at his age at that moment. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and I struck him and I killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defiled the armies, again, of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. By the way, the Hebrew word used for paw, paw, and then hand is the same word in that passage. It's a tie-in. He's saying that he's just the same. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped on his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Another moment of this story that was kind of an awakening to me this week as I was studying was looking at this moment where Saul puts the armor on David. I think what Saul does here with the armor is very suspicious. He's dressing up David to look like the king. He's dressing up David to look like the king. Given Saul's size, again, let's go back to that. There is no logical reason, no logical person would think that anyone in Israel's camp, even those David, actually by the scripture's description, later on uh, we just see him described as, as a ruddy you know, man. man. He's, like, he's actually probably pretty well built. He's a shepherd boy. He's been out in the field. But he's not as big as Saul. No one would think that this armor would in any way, in any way fit anyone else give, other than King Saul. And I believe given Saul's insecurity and the pattern of behavior you see through King Saul from chapter 11 to where we are in this chapter today, I think it's possible that Saul wants David to look like, move out there and make it look like he went out there when he didn't. See, Saul, the pattern with Saul 
Saul always wants to look the part of the king without doing the work that being king really requires, particularly the king of God's people. David isn't like Saul. Verse 40 says that David then took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. My son loves rocks. My three-year-old, he loves rocks. Everywhere we go, he picks up rocks and he adds them to his collection. And when we're talking about my son's rocks, we're talking about little itty-bitty rocks, like the things that are like the, the, the stuff that breaks off from the roadway or, you know, something like that. I think about the, the rocks that I used to go down to the brook myself, and it, we had a little, little creek near my house growing up, and I would go down there, and the little rocks we'd find down there. And if I'm admitting something, so often that, that's the image of what I've thought when this story was told of what these rocks are. You know, something that's maybe about the size of a quarter, or a little bit larger than that, and man, David slings, and that's what makes it even more miraculous, right? Like, wow, this little pebble, just like wham, on his forehead. The truth is, though, sling, sling stones were actually very common in warfare in that time, and it was a very common weapon to be used. And when David is picking a stone for his sling, historically speaking, well, we know that these, these stones would have been like the size of baseballs. And have, you ever, have you watched a baseball game recently? I mean, you know, there's a reason the batter wears a hard helmet, <laughs> because baseballs can do some damage. They can do some damage, and these could do some damage as well. And this was a common weapon. So when David comes before the presence of Goliath, when, David, when Goliath is mocking him, he's not mocking the weapon. He, the weapon is something you would see on the battlefield. It's just not maybe the, the weapon that he thinks it would be better to have, like a sword or a javelin. The thing that actually, actually Goliath mocks is, the, is the, shepherd's, the shepherd's staff that David has in his hand. And what Goliath doesn't understand is that nothing that David has in his hands really matters here at all. Because it's not David he's up against. <laughs> it's not David. Verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not just with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and he took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. And then, of course, later on, he'll take, you know, here's Goliath mocking him. You don't have a sword. You don't come at me with the right stuff, you know. And uh, David takes his own sword, the Goliath sword, and uses it to decapitate him. Is the final way, the message being sent. No, there is a God in Israel. What's the message of all this today? Seek clear spiritual vision to meet the behemoth challenge in front of you with faith. Behemoth. That's right. <laughs> Seek clear spiritual vision to meet the behemoth challenge in front of you with faith. We let go of our denial a couple weeks ago. We talked about that. Letting go of all these misguided illusions of, I'm okay, I'm okay, everything's fine in my life, everything's fine. We learned to let go, untie those ropes that were holding us down that we couldn't see before. We realized last week our own powerlessness to make a change permanent in our life, that transformation comes only by the power of God, and he's our only resource really for that. And so now God is, you know, we brought some clarity of vision. We let go of the things we were being deceived by, but now we're trying to look at reality. And we look at the reality in front of us, and sometimes the reality is an intimidating one as we get that, get that clear vision. As the vision is cleared, and we say, oh, my goodness, look what's up the mountain on me here. And God wants to, in the face of that, he says, okay, now here's where I want to take your heart, and I want to make it mine. I want to make it like mine, just like David, he did with David, the pursuit of the truth at all costs. No matter how ugly it makes me look, no matter how broken it makes me feel, no matter what it demands of me, I want to live in the truth or nothing. One of my wife's favorite TV shows to binge watch is Friday Night Lights. <laughs> just, 
It tells the story of a fictional high school football team in the fictional town of Dillon, Texas. And their coach gives the team this mantra that they use throughout the series. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Are we ready to see life, the real reality of our life, with clear eyes and full hearts that will allow us to pursue the truth at all costs and to see hardship as the pathway to peace? It takes faith. Bill Arnold shares this. There's a woman who has become an American cultural icon in the closing years of the 20th century who provides an interesting parallel to the story of David. One day in 1955, a 42-year-old African-American seamstress riding a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, violated segregation laws by refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger. The enemy, Rosa Parks faced, must have looked like an invincible warrior. The governmental laws and cultural norms were all aligned against her, and she was arrested for her refusal to conform. But she perceived things that others did not see, and she was confident in the righteousness of her cause. Her actions became the spark that ignited the civil rights movement. And later in life, Rosa Parks would say this of that incident. This is what she said. Knowing what must be done. You see how she moved to a place of, it was not like an option that it must be done. It had to be done. This was the only way. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. It was time for somebody to stand up, or she says in my case, to sit down. We're not just talking here about any challenges in our life. We're talking about the responsibility that we have in the midst of the work God wants to do. What is our responsibility in the midst of the challenges to God's work? Not just the the challenge, not what's our responsibility in the midst of the challenges he wants to do in in our country or in our state, our, our city, our church. But what are my responsibilities in the midst and in the face of the challenges of the work that he wants to do in my life? It was about the passionate pursuit of the character that God wants to develop in us. Author Jason Martinkus found the following mantra to be helpful to him as he faced the behemoth challenge of restoring trust in his marriage following his infidelity. This is the, this is the mantra he had. Nothing on the planet will stop me from becoming the man God is calling me to be. I love that attitude. I love that spirit. Nothing on the planet will stop me from becoming the man God is calling me to be. Dan Allenders gives us a picture of these moments of real clear, clear thinking. When clarity finally comes, he says this, talking about the deserts of life. The desert shatters the soul's arrogance and leaves the body and soul crying out in thirst and hunger. In the desert, we trust God or die. Trust God or die. All week long, I wrestled with this story because I want to be David but I'm Saul. Most of the time, I'm Saul. I believe most of us are, actually. Most of the time, a lot of times, we're Saul. That's the other part of the story I think we get off track with a little bit. David is, I mean, he's a great, it's, a great, it's a great thing to aspire to, and hopefully there are moments in our life when we rise to that challenge. But David is really intended in this story to be a precursor to somebody else that's not me in many ways. <laughs> We like to think we're David, but the truth is we're mostly Saul, the one whose tail is getting saved by the one with greater strength and greater faith. A thousand years after this story, the anointed one of Israel is going to stand on a battlefield face to face with his accuser, and this time what he'll do is he'll die. He'll die and save everybody in the process. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this story, an old story, Father, uh, a story many of us have heard many times, maybe we heard it in a fresh way today, or something, Lord, was sort of just awakened in us as we heard this story that helps us as we look at the the behemoth challenges in our life, as we look at the, the behemoth challenges, those challenges that seem almost insurmountable, Father, and uh, Father, we look, and, and maybe the past us, the past us who was always wrapped up in denial, man, I just won't look at it. I'll just convince myself it's good. I don't need to do anything about it. Now all of a sudden that denial's taken away. Father, we, we know we are just absolutely powerless to do anything without you in this moment. And so now we're looking at the only path forward. And the only path forward is finally the thing. 
It's that challenge. It's that mountain, Lord, right in front of us. And the challenge is now we walk forward because now we look and we see that the only, the way of hardship is actually the road that we've been looking for all along. It's the road to peace. Father, I ask, Father, that if, however this challenges us, maybe, Lord, today it's just simply starting a relationship with the one who will walk with us through that challenge. Maybe, Father, we're walking through the challenge and we find it just unbearably hard and we have no way, we're just gasping for air, Lord, and we're looking for you. Maybe, Father, today we just need prayer. And maybe today, Lord, we just need a fellowship. Maybe we're doing this on our own and we're looking as an immersed believer in Christ saying, I need, I need the support system to help me walk through this challenge, to be there for me. Lord, help whatever the decision is today. Give us the courage and the faith to overcome that challenge and to make it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a decision, let's make that as we stand and we sing and worship to our God.
Merci. I thought someone was following me. <laughs> Good morning. Blood is mentioned over 350 times in Scripture, and other uh, searchers say maybe as many as 469. Blood is used throughout Scripture. But what does Christ's blood mean to us? Matthew 26 contains one of the most well-known events in human history and certainly the most famous meal ever eaten, the Last Supper. Matthew 26 through 29 reads, While they were eating, Jesus, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. His blood redeems us. His blood brings us into fellowship with God. His blood makes us have peace with God. His blood cleanses us. His blood gives us power over the devil. As the disciples sat together, Jesus said, Take it and eat it, for this is my body. He then gave thanks and offered them the cup and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which seals the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out to forgive the sins of many. Jesus, as he often did, was speaking symbolically. To say he was speaking literally where here does not fit with the word pictures he often used. After all, Jesus said he was the bread of life. And didn't he say he was the door? So do we insist that Christ is an actual loaf of bread or a door? Of course not. Nor should we insist that the bread and the contents of the cup are actually Christ's body and blood. There is no evidence of a supernatural process that transforms the cup's, the cup's contents into Jesus' blood and the bread into his flesh. Therefore, as we participate in communion, we don't want to overly mystify what it represents. We don't want to think of the bread as flesh and the cup as containing blood. On the other hand, we don't want to devalue communion by thinking it means nothing. Clearly, the scriptures warn us about taking part in communion without recognizing its significance. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28 reads, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, and took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whoever, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The bread and the cup are not holy elements in and of themselves, but they do represent something that is very holy. So it is with great respect and reverence 
that we come to the communion table recognizing it is a symbol of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. Let's pray. God, we come humbly before you today and honor and glorify you and to remember the price you paid for our sins with your blood. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Dean, if you would, I'm going to have you come up here in a minute and offer our closing prayer, if you wouldn't mind. As we close out our service today, just a few announcements, reminders, and things I want to share with you. First of all, if the Lord's placed it on your heart to give and place the spirit of generosity there, uh, we want to encourage you in the ways that you can give, at least financially. Uh, you see there, there's offering boxes at the rear of the room near the doors on the way out. There's also online giving and the P.O. box there that are also options as far as how to, to send your gift here to Northside to help God continue to do what he's doing through those resources and impacting our community in a, in a wonderful way. Uh, also, well, this I'll mention as an aside to that as well, that next week we'll be giving you an update next week's, at the end of next week's service uh, regarding our capital campaign. So just put that on the radar and things uh, for you uh, to know kind of an update of where we're at, and we'll talk about that. Rob will come next week to do that. There are a number of things going on this evening. Uh, starting at 5 o'clock, Elementary Awana is going to be happening tonight. Project 412 Switch uh, is going to be happening tonight for our, for our middle schoolers and high schoolers, and also our adult groups are meeting this evening. Uh, my group will be meeting in the office lobby. That's for the three big questions that change every teenager uh, study. Uh, we'll be meeting in the office lobby tonight uh, for that. Uh, but then also uh, Wayne's study, of course, Wayne's out. That group has now changed as far as its location for the next couple of weeks to Wayne and Lisa Young's house. Uh, Wayne and, uh, Wayne's back there. Of course, he was introduced the, at the mor at this morning. Uh, gave us a welcome. Lisa's here. If you need directions to their house, <laughs> they, can show, they can tell you and, and share with you how to get there uh, for the next couple of weeks for Wayne's study on one faithful life, the life of, of Paul. Uh, this week, a number of things also going on. Wings will be meeting our women in, uh, in God's service ministry. They'll be meeting on Wednesday night at 6.30. Uh, Celebrate Recovery meets on Thursday night. And everyone is invited every Thursday night to be part of Celebrate Recovery. You see that there on the screen. Project 412 students also are invited to come uh, bowling. It's a bowling activity they have coming up later uh, this week on Saturday. So if you'd like to go bowling, uh, man, bowling is always fun. So we encourage you to see Clay uh, afterward, and, uh, and he can tell you more about that. Just a special note, some of you were probably anticipating it today, but since Wayne got sick today, uh, <laughs> or this week, uh, we're going to put it off a little bit, but we, were gonna, we have a special occasion this month. Wayne has been serving in ministry here at Northside for 25 years, Wayne Courier, 
Uh, and uh, since he's not here today, instead of today celebrating this, we're going to be celebrating at the end of the service on October 8th instead. But if you would like to participate, there's still time to participate in the card shower that we're going to be doing for him, or we are doing for him. There's a basket out on the information desk. If you'd like to include a card, just giving a congratulations and thanks to Wayne and all of that. Really would appreciate you to participate in that card shower for him. Uh, you can bring that, that card by on a Sunday and put it in the basket there. Uh, and so we want to encourage you to be, uh, to be part of that, and uh, it's a great opportunity to say thank you. Wayne's amazing, 25 years. Uh, 1998 is when Wayne started in ministry here at Northside, and so I appreciate him more uh, than I can express, to be quite honest with you. Uh, he's like my right hand in so many things, and so I really, really appreciate Wayne and his ministry. Today, if you're physically able, if you can help us after the service to pick up all the chairs, a special note, we need all the chairs stacked on the baptistry side of the room. Uh, so if you can help us to do that and put them in stacks of five to seven chairs high, that would be, that would be very uh, helpful for Awana and the activities we have later, coming up later this week. With that, Dean, if you would, let's stand together and Dean will close us with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Have a great week, everybody. Uh, just a quick note, what a wonderful message to have today. Uh, many of us were fa facing some bohemus this morning with the illness going around. And when I came this morning, I didn't have a voice. Uh, you can ask my poor granddaughter that heard me practicing on the way here. But God always does provide. And, and what a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that God works through us when he calls us to things. It's not our power, but it's his that makes things succeed. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for another opportunity to be in the house where we gather in your name. Thank you for this wonderful message. Let us take it into our minds and our hearts and take it into the world. Be with all that are here. Be with all that are joining us from home. And may your peace and understanding be with each of us. Give us your strength and may your light shine until we can gather again here to praise and worship you. In Jesus' holy name and the church would say, amen. Have a wonderful week.